three um, uh, important aspects to the policy. The first is that faculty members grant permission to the university to distribute their scholarly articles. The second is that uh, in order to make sure that the policy uh, cannot stand in the way of the best interests of the authors, a waiver of the policy will be issued for any article at the sole discretion of the author. So there's this process of requesting a waiver. It's described as a waiver request for technical reasons. It's the, the licensee that has to waive. The, the author can't waive it. But, so there has to be a request for a waiver, but the waiver will be granted upon request. There's no discretion on anyone's part except for the author. And then the third part is a, um, a deposit requirement so that the university can take advantage of this permission that it has and that the policy enables the faculty make their articles available by depositing a copy in the Harvard repository. So together these parts, uh, there's a, the permission, the waiver, and the deposit make up the policy that constitutes uh, uh, the um, action of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences and now the Harvard Law School. Okay, uh, now um, looking again at this first uh, uh, part of the policy, I'll just mention that uh, uh, faculty members um, grant to the university permission to make articles available. This provides an alternate supplementary means of access to the articles, and that, of course, is the entire point of the policy, since we can't rely on the um, uh, uh, serials publishing system increasingly, can't rely on it. This is a way of, uh, of augmenting that system with an alternative means of access for the articles. So a number of advantages of the policy. First, it, it, it makes a collective statement of principle that we think it's important that there be the broadest possible access to our writings. And I put, by the way, these, these advantages, I take them to be in order of importance. So from the most to the least important. Um, second, it provides for uh, acquiring in a systematic manner metadata about the articles that the faculty publishes. Why is that? It's because for every article, an, a faculty member either needs to generate an addendum or request a waiver. And in either case, we find out about the existence of the article and that it's an article that's important to maximize the access of, and we can take steps to do that. Even if, so if it falls under the open access policy and, and an addendum has been generated, of course, we can, Harvard has a license to uh, uh, distribute it. If a uh, waiver is requested, uh, well, at least we still know about the existence of the article, and we may still be able to distribute the article, because uh, many uh, copyright arrangements with publishers these days allow distribution through repositories, even uh, without these kinds of addenda. Third is that it completely clarifies the rights situation for the articles. So uh, um, for every article we know, either uh, it falls under the policy, and then definitively, the university has a right to distribute it. Or a waiver has been requested, and we know uh, the information about the article, the journal and the publisher and so forth, that allows us to clarify the right situation with respect to that journal and publisher. And so we'll know the right situation in either case. Fourth. Uh, it allows the university to facilitate the article deposit process because the university actually has a license. And fifth, it moves uh, some negotiating uh, ability from an individual to uh, the university as a whole. So it's the university now that has uh, all of these uh, rights. And uh, to the extent that there's um, uh, some middle ground between the university's um, view of what would be the optimal set of rights and a publisher's view of what, what would be the optimal set of rights, the university as a single entity can negotiate on behalf of the, of the faculty on those kinds of issues. Compare that to the current situation where each, for each article, an author needs to individually negotiate with, uh, with a publisher 
about uh, rights if that author is willing to do so. And finally, sixth, uh, what may be the least important, although it gets uh, most of the attention, is that uh, the um, uh, policy changes the rights retention um, situation from an opt-out situation, sorry, from an opt-in situation to an opt-out situation, and that may increase the, 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 the amount of rights retained. We don't know. Probably not going to make it any worse. Uh, and it may actually increase the amount of rights retention. Here's another uh, reaction from the uh, inside higher ed. <clears throat> says, Harvard's self-serving move weakens standards of peer review process. So this is a, uh, and it's, I have to say, this is a relatively representative reaction to the Harvard policy. It's based, of course, on a misunderstanding of the role of repositories and archiving. The idea here is not to have anything to do at all with peer review processes. And there is no peer review in the repository. So it doesn't weaken the peer review process. It's not an alternative to a peer review process. It's a supplement to the peer review process. The peer review process stays exactly as it was before. The entire journal publishing mechanism works exactly as it does before with peer review at the same level of standards. It's just that in addition to that, we now have an alternative means of getting access to articles written by Harvard uh, authors. The question whether this violates faculty rights somehow, somehow, uh, somehow um, impinges on academic freedom, that, that you, you're, you're telling the faculty um, where they have to publish or uh, how they have to publish. The, um, the, I have to say, there, not a lot of you, d you didn't get a lot of this reaction, but a few people would air this issue. Um, to a great extent, uh, that uh, the, any possibility that there would be some kind of violation of faculty rights is um, uh, completely mitigated by the fact that there's a waiver that's purely at the discretion of the faculty member. So if you think that there's some problem with the policy working on a particular article or all of your articles, you can uh, uh, get a waiver of the policy for an article or for all of your articles. You really need a very full discussion and everyone to become comfortable with the idea. It, it's, it doesn't do any good to tactically get something passed if there isn't really wide support for it because um, um, you, you, can, you can pass certain policies or you can declare certain policies. It doesn't matter. If people are not actually behind them, they won't have any effect. So, um, uh, so it's important to be patient. Um, the next thing I'd say is it turned out uh, important to um, the, the, the wording of the policy is very important, and in particular, uh, this uh, waiver ability uh, was crucial in getting people comfortable uh, that there wouldn't be unintended consequences at an individual uh, level. Because if worse comes to worst, in the face of an impending unintended consequence, one can always get a waiver of the policy. 